friends, my, my friends here today came all the way from uh, St. Cloud to be supportive of what I wanted to talk to you about today. We've been working together on an issue that's become pretty important to us, uh, which has to do with the subject of uh, the resettlement of political refugees around the world and how that affects our county in particular. I don't know if you got any uh, report or briefing on this matter, but uh, back in November, I forget which days they were, the um, coordinator for the refugee resettlement effort uh, with the state of Minnesota out of St. Paul uh, requested uh, the uh, director of family services here at the county to organize a meeting that took place over a couple of days. Uh, 20 people attended, uh, representing three county agencies, the uh, Wilmer School Department, uh, the Wilmer City Hall, the uh, mayor-elect, uh, Mayor Calvin was there, uh, a couple of vice presidents from Jenny O were there. Pretty big deal, and the subject of the meeting had to do with migration of refugees to Candioi County. Let me tell you the difference here. We're used to thinking about the uh, refugee issue in terms of those that uh, are leaving the uh, refugee camps in uh, East Africa, winding up on our shores and coming out to the counties, to the city, wherever they go. The big, uh, the big issue seems lately to be one that we really can't uh, get a handle on very easily, particularly from a financial planning standpoint, and that has to do with the secondary relocation of refugees from other states around the country. And the most recent data that we're seeing now from the uh, state of Minnesota specifically from the top Department of Health, now tells us that uh, of every city and town in the entire state, the city that is now attracting the most refugees is Minneapolis. The city that's attracting the second largest number of refugees is Wilmer. Not St. Paul, not Bloomington, not uh, St. Cloud, Mankato, Worthington, Wilmer. We suspect that uh, for the most part this has to do with family re reunification, but uh, best guess is that that's probably a, a number of factors contributing to this, but what we're seeing is the Somali community in particular has such a size and critical mass in Wilmer that now it, that critical mass in and of itself is probably the pi primary magnet, the primary draw for refugees coming here from mainly from Atlanta, California, and Texas. The last time we knew we were looking at a number that looked like something like 2,000, or roughly 10% of our population, we know that's quite conservative. I've been to two other meetings subsequent to this meeting in November. Uh, one was held out in uh, St. Cloud, sponsored by the uh, Lutheran Social Service Organization, which in Minnesota is the um, number one, what's called Voluntary Agency, or VOLAG, which is a con private contractor with the U.S. State Department and the uh, Department of um, Health and Services, the federal government, to aid in that relocation in Minnesota over the first six months that they're here. That meeting, interestingly enough, had about 35 what we call stakeholders, people that have some part, some incentive, some, uh, what would you say, exposure to the program. There was not one elected official there from the city or the city of St. Cloud or the county. There were no representatives of the school department. And these are the places where we're seeing the most impact, of course, the schools. The federal contracts that the VOLAGs have, that's what they're called, volunteer agencies, though they're hardly volunteers, requires that they have quarterly uh, consultation meetings with stakeholders, and those stakeholders are supposed to include representatives of the community. Uh, I would take a representative of the community to mean an elected representative, and I have not been to one meeting so far where I've seen a city councilman, uh, a county commissioner, anyone of an elected status at all. These are all people that have money to make off this program. We have good reason to think now that we're going to be looking at a big influx now in that the State Department, uh, at the urging of Senators Franken and Klobuchar, are advocating that um, the United States participate, along with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and the relocation next year, 
of 130,000 Syrian <coughs> refugees from Syria. The uh, director of the anti-terrorism division of uh, the FBI testified two months ago before Congress that the problem with bringing in refugees from failed states like Somalia and Syria is that there is no infrastructure in order for our government to be able to vet those people coming overseas. There's no records, there's no office, there's no way of knowing what we're getting when they show up other than the, the good word and good faith of the UN. And in his opinion, this next wave of refugees represents, as he called it, quote unquote, a pipeline to jihad. This is something we need to be concerned about, and I think particularly in outstate rural communities, because we're sort of off the radar on this sort of thing. And anyone that thinks that we can't have problems out here beyond the financial problems are kidding themselves. The number one problem that was brought up by the stakeholders at that meeting in uh, St. Cloud was the dearth, the shortage of five and six bedroom apartments. And since uh, state building codes assume that there are generally two people per bedroom, and you're probably looking the other way on a couple of couch surfers, and the people that I've talked to in the uh, UN High Commission uh, of Refugees Office confirm that they're generally looking at families with eight children. Now, by OMB poverty guidelines, a family of 10 in our area is anyone who, any family whose income is less than $49,000 a year. Now, if you're raising eight kids, you can't tell me that both parents are working unless they have their kids in daycare. And having eight kids in daycare is probably going to run you about four to $5,000 uh, a month. So that's not real likely. This leads me to think, and this is just educated guests that virtually every refugee that lives in this town is on one of seven forms of public assistance and I don't think that we've had an opportunity to stop and take a break after 15 years which is the length this program has gone on now to get a handle on what this is costing us many of the, the line items that you guys look on budget uh, at budget time you know you, you have some good assets there to make some planning and projections this is a crapshoot, and I think it's going to overwhelm us. The fact that we just had a $50 million bond approval in Wilmer for schools is most likely a consequence of some of this stuff. It's being driven in large part by, uh, by greed at the bolag level. It's being driven in large part by meatpacking. Because when you take a look all over the country at where this stuff seems to be located, it seems to be, for the most part, the northern Midwest. We know that we have about 30,000 refugees here right now, just of Somali extraction. And over this past year, they actually moved into third place. Now our primary relocation in Minnesota is from Bhutan and uh, Myanmar, which used to be called Burma. This is not going to end. It's not going to end, folks. If you're bringing in some, state economists say that to live out here, you need roughly a living wage for about $15 an hour. If you get a job at Genio for $10 an hour, the elementary question is a simple one. Where's the other $5 come from? We know where it comes from. And I suspect that number is going to get larger. And next year when the uh, minimum wage in Minnesota goes up to $9.50 an hour, that would suggest to me that the living wage will go up right along with it. Um, we're at the tip of the iceberg, and what we're going to see here is our population in Candy, Ohio County gets poorer, which it is, is we're going to see tax revenues start to go like this, and we're going to see social service and educational expenses go like this, and can you spell Detroit? I think by the end of this decade, we're not going to recognize this county, and I don't just mean by the color of the skin, it's going to dictate many of this, your decisions about where you can go with places like um, uh, transportation infrastructure and, and all those things that are wonderful. And I know that we need them, but uh, in terms of priority, I would suggest to you all that this, for our county, is the 800-pound gorilla that's sitting in the room right now. And it's spiraling out of control. And I think all we're hoping is that we can stop worrying about the race card and start talking about transparency and accounting. We know that we have at least seven, eight, nine, ten different expense items 
that are going towards fulfilling these expenses once the refugees are off the federal dole, which doesn't take very long, by the way. We need to start to get those numbers on the spreadsheet, consolidate them, see what we've spent, see what we're spending now, and see where this is going, or before we get in big, big trouble. I could easily envision this population doubling by the end of this decade. And I, I don't think we can afford it. I don't think financially that we can afford this any longer. We can't afford to turn a blind eye to it. I would like to see you guys uh, entertain the prospect of funding an, an audit of the county's financial exposure to the costs associated with refugee resettlement once these folks come off of federal supports. And that generally happens anywhere from three to six months. So say you're, you know, say you're a refugee that lives in San Diego, which right now is a pretty big primary resettlement site. For somewhere from three to six months, they're supported largely by federal dollars. The moment they leave to go somewhere else, those federal dollars don't follow them. And they're told that at the get-go. Once you leave, you're on your own. They say, that's OK. We'll find some other way out of milk and honey. So they show up in town, and the first place they show up is the first place you and I would show up if we were poor, had eight kids in tow, and had no jobs, right downstairs. So you have all the information in this building to know what the flow of people looks like, what the cash flow situation looks like, what the obligations are over the next year look like. It's all here. But I think you need to start taking a look at how it all adds up, because I think it's going to frighten the heck out of you. And I think if we're going to ask the public, and you brought this up, Mr. Madsen, about property taxes and taxpayers, if we're going to ask the public to cover these costs, they ought to know what they're paying for, because this is not charity. Charity is what I put in my collection plate when I go to church on Sunday. I don't get to volunteer taxes. Somewhere along the line, immigration ceased being a nation-building proposition for the United States, which is what built this area, right? We needed farmers from cold climates, from South Russia and Germany and Scandinavia. These folks are bringing no skills and illiteracy to the table. So if all of a sudden we're making a conscious effort as a county and as a nation to turn what used to be nation building into a social service program for the world, we ought to get some consensus from the people that that's the way they want to use their money because we've got a lot of people in this town living hand to mouth. Thanks for listening.